Howdy. Howdy. So, uh, today is April 25, a very special and historic day. Does anybody have any clue what is significant about April 25? That's called Anzac Day. It's a Veterans Day in Australia. So what I'd like to do is, and thank you Alan for the kind words, uh, we'll talk about what I do these days, flexible statistical modelling for big data. And talk a bit about my uh, personal journey. Uh, yeah, how I ended up here. And what I hope still to achieve. So I think personal history is a good predictor or at least a frame for what people, how people think and what they value. So I love to you know, read biographies and stuff and find out how people got their start. I'm going to push really hard about a powerful combination in research is both the intuition and the theory. And that documentary you watch provides some classic examples of that. The slides are going to be put up on eCampus afterwards so you can, get it, you can download them. I'm going to talk about big data and predictive models and then I'm going to look at some examples. One from oil and gas, New York City taxi fares, um, Southwest Airline ticket prices, Chicago taxi fares, uh, and then talk about uh, some emerging fields, and then um, my views about what it takes to be successful in college and in life. So I was born and educated in Melbourne, Australia. I went to the University of Melbourne. I could have been E.J. Williams' last student, and E.J. Williams was a student of R.A. Fisher. He was doing very, uh, at the time, kind of out of favour, old-fashioned likelihood methods that have come back into favour, but I decided no, that I would go to a small university called La Trobe University and work with somebody who had an, an international reputation for non-parametric statistics, a bloke called J.S. Moritz, and it was the best decision I ever made. So, in 1987, I was a visitor at Penn State. I taught for one semester, and I, they were keen to hire me, but my family circumstances were such that I wasn't able to do that, so the compromise was I moved to Sydney. Now, moving from Melbourne to Sydney is worse than transferring from Texas A&M to the University of Texas or vice versa. My family. So there, there are questions. I have brothers, as you'll see. And the question they ask me, will I come back to Australia? And if so, would I move back to Sydney, where I lived for 18 years, or would I move back to Melbourne, where I grew up? So you look there. I've had a, a management job in the university since July 1994. So I was put in charge of a review of the MBA program, and I didn't know this at the time, but I was going to transition to be the MBA director over a 12 to 18 month period. I was a professor of statistics in the business school. Well, it turned out the woman who was the MBA director, her husband was the CEO of a top 50 company in Australia, and he got fired. It was on the, the national news. So she left the university effectively that day and went back to corporate Australia to pay the bills. So literally within a week, I went from associate professor of statistics to in charge of an MBA program, which was really a, you know, an extraordinary thing. Um, I've been involved in distance ed since 1989 in, in Australia. If you think about Australia, it's a large place. Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne, Canberra, Sydney and Brisbane, we had about 3,000 executive MBA students. The last class I taught out of Sydney was five was business statistics 101 to 500 and something EMBA students in 21 separate locations. So in February 2005, I moved from Sydney, Australia to College Station, Texas. The rumor mill at, in Sydney was I was going to the University of Texas because she, the, I lived on Sydney Harbour. So that arrow, arrow points to a penthouse apartment on Mossman Bay and the, the picture next to it of the yacht is the view from that, is the view from that particular apartment. You could see the ferry come around the corner and you had time enough to get in the elevator and run and get on the, get on the ferry. There was a boat there called Uptown Girl and when I used to host parties for Hong Kong civil servants, I said that was Billy Joel's Australia boat, but it wasn't. So, uh, the rumour mill was flat out wrong. I, I didn't go to the University of Texas. 
So when I came here, I got asked a lot about my ancestry. I grew up thinking I was from convict stock. It was actually a badge of honor when you were in high school. And if your, if your forebears were actually ax murderers, that was better than if they stole a loaf of bread. But it was pretty hard to find out. But the great thing about the internet and the great thing about my last name, Sheather, is it's quite unusual. So there's a Sheather family webpage in the UK and I was able to trace back my ancestors. So Henry Sheather was born in Breed, Sussex in October 1797. 68 years later, he died in, died in Sydney, Australia. In 1838, he immigrated from uh, England to Australia by ship. This was a six month voyage. He was an agricultural labourer who importantly could read and write. So that was a huge step up in those days, being able to read and write. And he came to work, <laughs> he came to work for James MacArthur, who was the governor of Australia. And uh, he has a famous sheep farm. And so in fact, what these guys did was they worked to feed the convicts. And this Camden Park is uh, a national treasure, a national estate. is a national estate you can go and visit. And then my grandfather James was the first Sheather to be born in Australia. My father Kevin, um, uh, you can see he lived to be 89. Uh, I won't tell you my birthday, birth year, but you'll be able to figure it out at least roughly. And my brothers are very, uh, uh, you know, they love the fact that there's a Sheather's Lane in Camden. They all have pictures of themselves and their kids below this Sheathers Lane, named after my family. So, I had three brothers. My mother was a nurse, she was a saint. I was born November one year. Martin was born November the next year. Andrew was born December the next year. My mother had a year off for good behavior. And then my youngest brother, Tim, was born in, uh, was born in August, the year after. Four sons in four years. So which one am I? You want to bet? Anybody got a clue? Yep. The bottom left is a shifty one, no. No, that's not me. Top right. Top right, yes, that's me. I was the oldest. So I ended up being a professor. I was first generation in college. And I got told right from the first week that first generation kids are really a high chance to fail. It used to cheese me off, because I'm gonna be polite because I'm being recorded, that they had put a lot of energy into telling you that you were likely to be a failure instead of actually helping you. So one of the things I'm doing this year is at new student conferences, for the first time they're having faculty give a 30 minute lecture to the students and a separate 30 minute lecture to the parents. I got selected to do that, it'd be great. So Martin's next, yeah, he's the shifty looking one, he works in banking. Andrew is the one who is a contractor. He could sell holy water to the Pope at a good price and the Pope would be happy. When he was a teenager, he had curly hair and he used to iron it straight, literally with the iron. He had his brother help him. And then Tim, he runs a car racing team. So he's run the, run the Mercedes-Benz car racing team in Australia. He was here for Thanksgiving last year and uh, he was here the year before and they got confused about how long it would take them to get from Las Vegas to Los Angeles. Um, they got the kilometers and miles confused and they ended up getting pulled over doing 135 miles an hour in a Mustang. And he got off with a warning. And he still got the warning put up in his garage and the policeman said to him, sir, what, what color are your eyes? And, he, and uh, they look brown, he goes, no, no, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this properly, my eyes are hazel. So I'm a fanatical supporter of the Essendon Football Club. This is Australian rules. Not rugby, not soccer. Basically, if Dr. Dabney's a forward and I'm a back, and the ball, he's trying to catch the ball, if I can convince the referee I had my eyes on the ball, I can hit him as hard as I want, as long as I keep my feet on the ground, between the waist and the shoulders. And uh, Anzac Day is a very special day in Australia. This is this is just amazing. Hello, come in, sir. Um, Anzac Day is a very famous day in Australia because they have a traditional football match between Essendon and Collingwood. 
and we have been smashed for years and years. So I was up at 3.30 this morning watching my team win by 18 points. Yes. So uh, we won the version of the Super Bowl in 84, 85, 93, and in 2000. In 2001, I sponsored Dean Wallace. That means I signed a contract to write two checks, one at the start of the season and one in the middle of the season, and I had to go and get an external job as a consultant to pay for those checks. And the reason I picked Dean Wallace, because he was a hard man. If you messed with any of the junior players, Karma knew your address. So I had a boss at the University of New South Wales, the last guy I worked for, who sponsored players at another team. He wouldn't come in my office because I had a picture of Dean Wallace up on the wall. And here's a great marketing thing. Simon Shearer, thank you for being part of the 2000 Premiership team. So because I was a sponsor, I got this personalised letter that I have had framed. So in the year 2000, we won all the pre-season games. We won 21 of the 22 regular season games. The full forward got dragged down by the back of the shirt and the referee missed the free kick. We would have won all 22. We won all the finals. So we had four of our players. There's 22 in the All-Australian team. There are 18 teams. We had four of our guys in the, in the, in the All-Australian team. But we have really fallen on hard times. Horrible hard times, but that's okay. When I was a kid growing up, I never saw my team win. I was about to turn 23, and Essendon had won 15 games in a row, and were going for the 16th, and I went to the game. And Nobby Clark passed the ball backwards to Roger Merritt, and it got intercepted, and we lost. I'm a very serious collector of fine wines. When I moved from Australia in 2005, I bought 1,200 bottles of wine with me. The first thing I did when I received a letter inviting me to apply to be department head was check whether this was a dry county. <laughs> and then when I got here, I put my name down on the waiting list. Costa Brown, it takes six years from when you apply to when they'll actually give you some wine. And Cirque is, so Costa and Brown are, are two blokes who used to be waiters in the wine country. And they literally saved up their tip money and started a vineyard. Costa is the sales guy and Brown is the brilliant winemaker. And I went in spring break to a wine dinner and got to sit with Michael Brown. It was incredible. And he has his new tree house. So Cirque is the thing that's incredibly rare. It looks cheap because there are handwritten labels. And then some of my other favorites, Aubert makes the most stunning Chardonnay. Paul Hobbs makes Beautiful everything, Pinot and Chardonnay. Morlay makes incredible Syrah and Chardonnay. Morlay's a third generation winemaker from France. He met a, an American woman there in Paris on exchange, Jody, fell in love with her. Guess what? He's now making wine in he's now making wine in America, not in France. So for nine years I was the department head. I was some of my proudest achievements are hiring Dr. Dabney. Um, I was flying somewhere on the Friday he was, and I never fly out of the local airport. Never have, never will. If there's just the slightest wind or rain shower, they cancel all the flights. So I drove him down to the Houston airport, and I was convinced from that two-hour conversation that he was the guy for us. And his achievements are extraordinary. He's a good role model for you guys. So one of the things I'm really proud of is in the first ever rankings of statistics departments was the US News and World Report in 2010. We were ranked 12th overall, but third amongst statistics departments in public university. This is a great school. So growing up in Australia, I was aware of the Department of Statistics at Texas A&M. So you've made a good choice. So as Alan said, in fall 2007, I started an MS statistics program online. So the way it works is, imagine I was teaching in a class today, I'd be doing exactly what I'm doing now. Whatever's said through the microphone goes up on the screen, is written on the fancy whiteboard, any question you guys ask is captured, recorded, and the students watch the class. So I came here, that was what I promised to do. Some of the senior faculty members says this will never work. They used to go around behind my back and I've got great 
roller decks. The walls talk to me, saying, this guy's clueless, he's foreign, this is not going to work here. And the same people now take credit that it was their idea and I just showed up. But this produces $1 million of revenue for the statistics department every year. $1 million. So anything that you get that's above the ordinary is funded out of this program. We started with 20 students. We've had more than 200 graduates. In 2012, three statistics professors, me and two buddies, we put in $60,000 to start a company, Texas A&M Statistical Services, a limited partnership. We own it 1% and the university owns 99%. So I love to talk to companies. My aim each year is to have 1,000 meetings. I haven't ever quite gotten to that. I've gotten in the 800s. And I love to talk to external people. So sometimes they say, can you get us a, an intern for the summer? Can you find me somebody we can hire? Can you actually tell me what program one of my guys can do? Or can you actually help us with a project? So I taught MBA Stat 1 and MBA Stat 2 in 1990 to a young man from Hobart, Tasmania. He's now vice president of one of the biggest companies in London. And I am working on their customer data. Four billion rows. 4,000 million rows. And what I've been given is two years of customer data. It's not a cell phone company, but let's imagine it is. Two years of customer data, and my job is to predict in the third year whether somebody's going to renew their contract or not. And it's astonishing what they know about you. It's astonishing. Anything you do with something like this or this other product or service they know. More than 400 reasons to call the call centre. Which are the most important? That's an interesting problem. Yeah. just want to say something for your benefit real quick. Uh, you have seen data set in your classes. So Excel spreadsheet is a bunch of rows. Typically that's individuals that might be clients or people in a clinical trial. But those are the things, the individuals that you're studying. And then in the columns are your variables, like a response variable or statistic variable. So if you ever see capital B, big capital B, Thank you. So I was a fish camp namesake. That's one of the things I'm most proud of. I spent the summer working with my counsellors. I terrorised them because I threatened to give a 45 minute talk on the importance of statistics to the freshmen. How many people here went to fish camp? A few. It's really a great experience. The food is just disgraceful, but apart from that. <laughs> and the accommodation it is terrible even for the faculty. Anyway, I'm delicate. So in 2013, as Alan said, we started the MS Analytics program joint with the Mays Business School. I miss being in business school. I love to teach business school students. They're more in your face. They'll argue with you, right? They will argue with you. So um, Alan teaches a multivariate course this semester for me down in Houston. I teach time series and predictive modeling, two separate classes. And yeah, the students like to argue. So this is 75% statistics and 25% business. Um, I have an award in honour of my dear old mother who, for the best project in analytics in a not-for-profit setting. So then we come to this algorithms. What did we learn from the documentary? There's no perfect way to do sorting. There's no perfect way, right? Mm -hmm. This used to be a really big deal in the 1970s and 80s, sorting stuff. Right? Yep. Just how important it can be for the example of the uh, matching algorithm we use in uh, Great Britain with the, the uh, donor patients and we need to sort it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What else? Yeah. The biggest problems are the ones you can't tell whether you can use an algorithm, an efficient algorithm to find the answer or you can't if you don't know it's in a gray area. Right. Absolutely. A thing I love is that there's a strong intuition behind each of the algorithms. Remember how we. He went through the sorting ones. 
So when I was a student, I had a summer job at the University of Melbourne. I used to take photographs. I used to crack bad jokes. So there were a lot of kids that had terrible photos because I had bad jokes. And that was in the morning. And when the thing was shut, we used to alphabetize the forms. The form was a big, giant poster board that was ripped up into eight pieces and alphabetized. And so the rule was, throw them in piles. A to C, G to G, H to K, L to N, O to S, T to Z. And this pre-sort stuff really works incredibly well. So here you can see him that says, let's just roughly order these and then order between pairs. There was a strong intuition, right? There was a strong intuition behind each. And what I'm going to argue that intuition and mathematics are really a powerful combination. One without the other is somewhat delinquent. So I'm very proud of my academic record, more than 80 articles and two books. This month I surpassed 10,000 citations. I have a very special bottle of wine to celebrate that with. And um, one of the things I'm most well known for is the, it's called the She the Jones Bandwidth Selector. It's available on Jump, Mathematica, MATLAB, Python, R, SAS, and Stata. It's astonishing how it's used everywhere. And I want to tell you a little bit about it without getting into the math. I don't know if you've done, you've certainly seen histograms, the left hand picture, where you just count the number of points in each interval. Right? You, get a, you get a rough picture, it's not smooth. If the underlying density is smooth, then why not draw a density function above each of the points? That's what we do in the second picture. You see all those red density functions centered at each of the data, and we're going to add those up. And when you add those up, you get here a bimodal distribution. Okay? So let's look at an example of 500 data points from a normal distribution. It's the easiest density to estimate, it turns out, and the Sheather Jones bandwidth selector produces an estimate that looks pretty normal. Least squares cross-validation goes crazy and produces way too small a bandwidth, and so it thinks that there's at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven modes, seven modes. It way under smooths. So least squares cross-validation does terribly on simple problems, terribly on simple problems. So you can always, um, you can always pick uh, uh, an example where you do well with generated data. And a lot of the robustness people just cycle through examples until you actually find one that really does well. Then the second picture, figure five, is real data. And this is the average number of putts per round for the top 175 golfers in 1980 and 2001. And you can see that the number of putts for the 1980 folks is around 30, and for the 2001 is around 29. And again, um, the cross-validation thing gives way too many modes for one of the densities, way too many modes. So, Olga Savchuk is a student who is a graduate, Jeffrey Hart's a professor, who's actually well known for cross-validation. So when I came here, we started working together about can we fix cross-validation? So if you look, this is hundreds of credit scores, and you can see least squares cross-validation gives again way too many modes. She the Jones plug-in gives a bandwidth of around 11.4, and then this thing called indirect cross-validation works really well. So what we did was we say, okay, cross-validation does great if the problem is difficult. So we're going to make it difficult. We're going to change the kernel function from a standard normal kernel to one, to one of these here. You can actually look, look at the one that's the solid curve. It's very thin at the, in the middle and it has these big negative regions. <laughs> it's like the dumbest thing you could do, right? the dumbest kernel you could do if you're actually interested in estimating the density. But we're not. We're interested in estimating the bandwidth. So we've made this, using intuition, into a difficult problem and cross-validation should do well. So then we know the proper bandwidth for the wrong kernel. So how do we get that back for the, for the kernel like the Gaussian one? And the Sheetha Jones solved the equation. What equation do we solve? They actually turn out to be similar ideas. 
So a piece of intuition followed by a piece of mathematics, the relative convergence rates gives you a beautiful example. And then people in Australia thought I was really weird. I moved to Texas and having criticised cross-validation for 20 years, I wrote a paper in JASA about cross-validation. So, right, right, and the irony was that they rejected the sheet of Jones bandwidth paper. It's been cited 2,000 times. There you go. Not that I remember. <laughs> okay. So here's my go. Intuition and theory is a very powerful combination. You can have a lot of intuition, then you'll need some theory person to help you get it published. You can do theory and then you're what I call a point and click person. Okay, I got a problem, I'm gonna point you to it, I'm gonna click go, off you go solve it. And you'll be useful for a few years as an assistant or associate or as a junior person in a company and then you'll go past your use by date and they'll find the next point and click person that actually knows the newer technology. So it's important you do both. And then be wary of naive use of cross-validation. Be wary. So the poster session last week, oh man, people, some of the students use cross-validation. It gets me going. So speaking of which, Ryan Tipsharani is Rob Tipsharani's son. So the father is a genius and the son is a genius. He might be even smarter than the father. He's a professor at Carnegie Mellon. There's a method called lasso which is a variable selection method. What we do is we shrink some coefficients towards zero, but we need to know the smoothing parameter lambda for that. It's really important. You can use cross-validation, and then what you do is you use the one standard error rule. If you use just cross-validation, it produces too small a smoothing parameter, and you include way too many variables, right? It's like you've got too many modes. Okay, guys, well, let's fix that. Maybe we need to change the kernel function for the cross-validation. No, no, we've got this uh, uh, fudge factor, as we call it in Australia. You just add one standard error. So you take what the, the number is and you add one standard error to it because it works better. Why one? Why not two? Why not 0 0.7632? I don't know. So there's a great practical problem that's yet to be solved. And notice, I'm not criticizing Tib Sharani. He's just, this is in a class, he's just stating what, what the accepted uh, norm is. So what I do these days is I work on what's called big data. And big data can be like relatively small or it can be giant sized and we're going to look at both. So there's no rigorous definition. It's, uh, usually it's talked about volume, but I think the most practical definition of big data is you can't read it into Excel. Right? You laugh, but if you go and talk to business, can I read that into Excel? Or can you actually read this into R in a standard way? That's what I would call big data. The shift is taking place from collecting some data to gathering as much as possible. Let's take N equals all. So every customer's, every interaction with the company for over a two year period, N equals all. That's big data. Or it doesn't have to be big in absolute terms. So let's look at an example that I used as a term project. Inside Airbnb is a website that provides uh, ratings. So what they've done is they've scraped the Airbnb website for different cities. This is New York. You can go, there are 14,929 listings that there were when I downloaded this. You can, in red, it's an entire home or apartment. In green, it's a private room in an apartment. And in blue, which is very rare, is it's a shared room. There are only 15,000, there are only 15,000 establishments. That's not really big data. You could use that in Excel, you do whatever you want. But that is big data in the sense that it's N equals all, right? That's all the data that exists. This is giant data. So a company called First Analytics gave us access to daily gasoline prices over a 26 week period for 100,000 retail outlets. That's 18 and a half million. So one of my colleagues said, can you email it to me? <laughs> it gets better. Okay, it doesn't fit on email. Can you put it on the thumb drive? No. So Kim, our IT person, she put it up so they could file X. 
They didn't have enough room on their computer, their laptop, to even download the stuff. Boom. And this is really interesting too. So it's data over space and over time. And a lot of the companies, the oil companies, have sold the gas stations, especially in small towns, to mum and pop operations. Right? So Mad Mary is going up against Fiery Fred, and they're going to have a price war on Friday afternoon and drop the price of gasoline by 50 cents. So you have over space and over time with outliers. One of the analytics students did this as a project space-time model for every ExxonMobil gas station. It was astonishing. So, two types of statistical model. Explanatory model is a model that's interpretable. It's the opposite of machine learning. So if you deny somebody a loan in Texas, you have to explain in broad terms why you were denied. Your credit score is too low. You've had too many jobs. Your loan to value ratio. You've got to be able to point. On the other hand, predictive model is we've got to predict the future. I travel a lot. So, you know, when you go and you swipe your card in the gas station and you enter the code, enter your zip code, they have to do that in real time. Is that a fraudulent transaction or not? You don't really care about the predictive part, right? You don't care at all. You just want this to be efficient, effective, and quick. Now, I love, well, so the standard an answer from what I call the mousetrap people, and I'll explain the mousetrap people shortly. Because you know, you've probably never seen a mousetrap, but we'll get to that. So N equals all versus sampling the data. If we're interested in estimating population parameter, right? what's the mean ticket price? What is the mean taxi fare? What is the mean cost of renting a room in New York on Airbnb? You can do a sample. You don't actually have to do a very big sample to estimate that population parameter really easily. But that's not what people are interested in. Instead, they want to predict each customer's behavior ahead of time. Right? Given what I know about you, given what you've called, the reasons you've called the call center and the number of times you've done it, I want to be able to predict whether you're likely to not renew or not. How many people have ever seen a mouse trap at home? Oh, you have? Okay. Wow. When I was a kid growing up working class, we had them. But then when, you got, when I got a job, you had the pest control people come and spray and you never needed the mousetrap. So I called the sampling people like the mousetrap people. There's a much better solution, isn't there, than setting out mousetraps. There's to get the pest people to come and spray so you don't get the mice in the first place. So what we're interested in is developing keep sophisticatedly simple models. Sophisticated enough that when you go and talk to the biology expert, the financial expert, the business expert, they won't shoot holes in your model. Simple enough that you can actually use the model, that you don't have to write it on five blackboards, that you could actually put this into production. And Einstein said it beautifully, we want to make the model as simple as possible, but no simpler. So typically one of the big tasks is to take thousands of predictors, thousands of them, billions of rows and narrow those down to the most important 10 or 20. I love Wikipedia. As you can see from my personality, I love back and forth. So I love being an expert witness. And in Australia, lawyers are more polite to professors than they are here. I did a deposition in Dallas once. The lawyer was an Aggie, was real nice, shake your hand. How you going, sir? Talk about the, why did you, how did you end up here? This is great. Thank you for your contributions to Texas A&M. Turn on the tape. Attack dog. Attack dog. And I was doing binomial confidence intervals in small samples. So I used the Klopper-Pearson method, which is this biometric 1920 thing. And I thought, I wonder what the lawyer will have. I bet you he has Wikipedia. Yep. So all of the questions I got were out of the Wikipedia page. So now I always look at Wikipedia. And here's Wikipedia about predictive analytics. The dark blue says we want a model to make predictions. We want a model that captures relationships to allow assessment. So my experience is people want both. People want both. And when I supervise grad students, I say, I want you to develop a model that we can interpret the coefficients. 
and then I want you to interpret a machine learning model, a random forest, and see which does better. If the random forest does substantially better than the parametric model, then you're missing something in the parametric model. But my experience in business is they always want to interpret the coefficients. <laughs> so this company was, w is going to invest in something that came out of my analysis. So they want to know the whole nine yards about the model because it's not me that's going to get fired. It's the vice president there that's going to get fired if they spend all this money and it doesn't have the right effect. Lending Club is a peer-to-peer -peer lending group. The data is available on Kaggle. There are about 100 columns. So imagine a colleague and I, we wanted to start a winery. Long story short, had the vines genetically modified from the best vineyards in California. We had three droughts in a row in Texas, didn't grow at all. So imagine we wanted to get money to, fu to fund that. Banks just laugh. Lending Club is peer-to-peer. -peer. So if you've got some spare money, you can invest in this. And they make all their data public. So across the bottom is FICO difference. Current FICO minus FICO at origination. So if you're, that is minus 200. That says your FICO score between when they gave you the loan and when right now has gone down 200 points. Presumably you've lost your job, defaulted on your house, right? Stop making your house payments. Then with 200, you have like a 95% chance of default. That's the blue logistic curve. Now it turns out that that one variable does better than a naive use of every other variable in the data dictionary. And it's interesting because on Kaggle they have the data and they've taken away the current FICO score because it makes the problem too easy. This is called feature engineering. That's why I don't like just naive machine learning. Feature engineering is you go and ask an expert what is the best predictor of default. So 400 reasons to call the call center. I thought I was a genius. Code 555 was a great predictor of people not renewing their contract. So I talked to these guys and they started laughing. Because you know what code 555 is? Let me clean it up. It's somebody's rude and abusive and they call up and say, you can stick your dot, dot, dot machine. <laughs> it's out on the sidewalk. Please come around and pick it up at your convenience. So that's using why to predict why. So a lot of those machine learning algorithms, if you don't understand the data, and this wasn't 100% predicted because not everybody did that. There are still some polite people in Britain. But if you'd done a machine learning thing, code 555 would have been in all your solutions and would have been useless. So, oil and gas and Houston go hand in hand. The oil price has gone down a lot, but it started to come back. A lot of our students, about 30% of them in Houston are oil and gas. This is an example out of a, a text written by a bloke called Holdaway, who's a good buddy of mine. What they want to be able to do is maximize production and minimize cost. There's this stuff called propent and frac fluids. So you actually literally put all of this fluid down to break open the rocks to make the mine work. So there were more than 100 variables. He came up with a list county, total depth, etc. I added a couple of others, carbonate number of stages. And the standard thing is to just look at a model with first order terms and it turns out that county is the most important thing. Guess what? Location, where you are, is the most important thing. And then you ask, is the first order model valid? So a lot of people rush to do a variable selection. We've got hundreds of columns, stick them all in, and then use some variable selection. Lasso, forwards, backwards. But if the model's wrong, you're getting the best model amongst models that are incorrect. So there's this wonderful thing called marginal model plots. The red curve and the blue curve. If you just look at it, does the red curve match the blue curve? No, 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 no. Not even close, right? I used to put a blindfold on in class in Australia and go and touch the screen with my hands. But that's not politically correct here when it was obvious. So what are the curves? The red curve is your favorite non-parametric fit to the data. So that's the y, the output variable, as a function of the predictor. 
and you can see that that kind of goes up. That makes sense because we've got, we've assumed a linear model, right? Then if you actually do a smooth of, no, that's the fitted values. So the red is the fitted values. The fitted values are linear functions of the data. So the curve looks approximately linear. If you actually do a smooth to the data here, it turns out you need quadratic terms and interactions, and it shows up. Okay, there's a guy called Wong, W-H-A-N-G, who put in an open records request to the New York Taxi and Limousine Commission in 2013 asking for data on every taxi fare in New York. They thought he was crazy, but he was persistent, and they gave it to him. And then people like all over the country, including a bloke called Simon Shee that put in a request, so they got so sick of doing this, they actually put the data up on a public website. One billion individual taxi trips. It's, when I saw this, I wanted to weep. I was so excited. <laughs> and then there's the DB1B database. This is uh, airline origin and destination survey. Every quarter, they publish a 10% sample of all airline tickets in the US. 10% sample. In that one quarter there, there's more than 11 million bookings. Wow. You can actually get a job for a bunch of consulting firms just literally fitting models to this. So if you work for American Airlines, you know all your own fares, right? But here's the deal. You have all the competitive stuff here. So Walmart, I said to this guy at Walmart, why do you bother um, subscribing to the Nielsen data? You have market dominance. You know your own stuff. He goes, we don't know the competitors. And we like to run experiments at the competitors uh, at the, that uh, maximize the gap between our market share and theirs. Right? So this is a recent article I did for a fight shrift for a bloke called Joe McCain. And this is applications of robust regression to big data problems. And so what I did was look at different robust regression estimates. You'll see there are horrible outliers in the airline data and in the taxi data. There are trips that are very short that cost 50 bucks. And there are tickets that are free or frequent flyer tickets that are essentially zero. So we need robust regression estimates. There's two types. The top one is when we move the points down in a vertical direction. If something's a vertical outlier from the line, we move it down. But imagine something is an outlier in the x direction. We actually have uh, somebody catches a cab from New York to Boston, right? There's a huge outlier that's been done. We need to worry about that. So uh, the guy McCain has this software package in R. So he, anyway, I use SAS. Here are the estimates. I'll let you look at them in, in detail. And I did it for one Tuesday. I wanted around 50,000 data points, and the simple reason was so the people who had standard implementations of R could analyze the data. 50,000 was the drop dead limit. If I put in 100,000, the algorithms which use iterative ways to find the minimizers of functions, some of the functions are not even convex or some of these things, it fell over. So what I did was take um, one Tuesday, rate code is one, standard city rate. I took trips, short trips of less than three miles where the average speed was greater than 25 miles. So that there wasn't a lot of stop time because you have to pay extra for stop time, right? For slow traffic and stop time. Here's the data. And <laughs> have a look at some of these outliers. There's a rule. It says the fare is $2.50 to sit in the cab and it's 50 cents for every two tenths of a mile. So it's 2.50 plus $2.50 a mile, right? So we should be able to reproduce for the median fare that formula, should we not? Yes, we should be able to reproduce that. Well, it turns out we can only do that with the M estimator. Here's the M estimator. Look at least squares, says it's around $2.27. Uh, 
And then for the slope, again, the M estimator is the only one that reproduces the truth. Notice how narrow the confidence intervals are. One of the things you'll learn is these confidence intervals say it's $2.50 plus or minus a fraction of a cent. So if I tell you, if you use your fancy method, suppose you use least squares and you don't know the answer, you're convinced that the intercept is between 225 and 230. You're convinced. If you use this M estimate, you say it's right around 250. That's scary. Yeah. You'll learn about it. So let's look at 78,900 uh, Southwest Airlines flights. I want to make the model as simple as possible. So it's only a single booking. It's a return journey, right? So here we go. If you have a look, two straight lines fit the, fit the data pretty well. It's called a spline. Multiple adaptive regression splines developed by Freeman at Stanford in the early 90s are used lots of places because it's easy, they're easy to interpret. But have a look here at the frequent flyer tickets. All of these tickets that are really low. So what most people do who analyze this DB1B, they take anything less than $50 and remove it from the data. I'm always uncomfortable about removing data points. Anyway, so we fit a spline and the cutoff point was this 1500. So we had a line of slope here and then we had a line of less slope there. And again, have a look at what happens if you look at, at my f at, uh, least squares, it says it's around 14 and a half cents a mile. 14 and a half cents a mile is what the cost is. That's what the revenue is, right? Boss, boss, you get 14 and a half cents a mile. No, I learned this great thing in college called least trim squares that can handle up to 49% outliers. Well, least trim squares says you get six and a half cents a mile. Shoot me now, because I'm going to get five. If you tell someone <laughs> that they're going to make six cents a mile when it is really around 14, they'll know, right? That's, they'll know from the back of an envelope calculation that, that your model is not, doesn't pass the does this make sense test. Have a look at how narrow the confidence intervals are, right? So you have estimates that give very different answers that are very precise. And then let's have a look at what happens after the the second slope, least squares says it's around four and a half cents, and the others say it's around two and a half or three. One is a factor of double, and the other one's a factor of like two and a half or three. It's hugely different, right? Why is this? The confidence intervals are wrong. In Australia, we wouldn't call them wrong. We would call them flat wrong, or wrong squared. So why are they wrong? What have we missed? Implying high precision. What's wrong with the interval? Use the standard methodology. What's wrong? What could be wrong? Have you done T confidence intervals? X bar plus or minus S, T star S on red N, yes? What's one of the crucial assumptions there? is the data is independent, right? The observations are independent of each other. Yes? Well, we don't have independence here. We don't. And weak dependence in small samples is not a big sin. So, no account is taken of the time of the day, day of the week, the two airports you fly between, the number of days between when you bought the ticket and the flight, and how many vacant seats. So, if you want to fly on Friday afternoon out of Houston to another big city, and you buy the ticket the day before at a popular time around between 4 and 6 p.m., you will pay a fortune. So there's all this dependence that's not in the model, right? All this dependence. So it's amazing. And right around the time I was doing this, there's a fellow called D.R. Cox. He's a smart bloke. 
Fox Cox Transformations, Cox Proportional Hazards. He wrote this paper that says, with very large amounts of data, direct use of standard statistical methods will tend to produce estimates of very, apparently very high precision because of the assumptions of at most weak dependence. So what you should do here is actually build a model that takes account of the dependence. So that's how we've changed. Right? We could have randomly sampled. We would have done a better job to randomly sample the data and actually estimate those, those slopes. But here, we've got this mindset. We want to understand the data for every customer. So right before the holidays, the city of Chicago put up 109 million rows of taxi fare data that has more information than the New York City one. And I got really excited. I tried to download it twice and it fell over, so I had to get Kim Ritchie, our IT person, to figure out how to do this. 109 million rows. Now, this is the, and what they give you is they give you this for each medallion. A medallion is the right to own a cab. It's literally a thing you put on the front of your automobile that says you have the right to drive a taxi in Chicago. And you can see in 2013, it cost at auction about $350,000 to buy one of those. There are a few outliers, people went broke, they sold them within their family, etc. And then look, recently, what do you think? Uh, you, well, you, the number being sold is greatly diminished and you're going to getting $50,000. So imagine you're a small business person, you borrow the 350 to get, have the right to own a cab, you pay for the car, boom, that's a big investment. There's at least $400,000 there, right? So what I did was take Lazy Larry, the bottom 25%, Mary Median, the median, and then the upper 25%. This is money through the taxi. This is no expenses. I don't know how much they spent on gas. I don't know how much they spent on maintenance, right, etc., etc. How much they paid drivers. This is on a monthly basis. Now, if you have a look at the curves in the left-hand plot, you see a decreasing trend, but you also see some seasonal patterns, don't you? Yes? So, the moral of the story that we just learnt was we need to fit models that take account explicitly of dependence. So, we, that's what we're going to do. I'm going to fit the green line, the red line, and the blue line taking account of the dependence. And have a look at my forecast. Right? The curve is what is forecasted for every month, and the, the circle is the actual. This is an astonishingly good fit. Now, I'm only as good as what is my out of sample fit, but I don't have this here, I'm gonna do that next. But interestingly, the intercept was $8,332. So that means at the start of 2013, you'd had $8,000, $2,000 a week. That doesn't sound very good. I don't know about you, but I wanna certainly get paid more than that. And then it went down at $55 a month, $53 a month, so they went from $8,000 down to five. Scary, right? Scary. And the two coefficients are both order regressive. So it, it says what happened last month and what happened this month last year. And that this month last year is a more important factor. And then I did the same for the other two. It's interesting that the, the reduction, the median was 6,000 a month Lazy Larry was three and a half thousand dollars a month, less than a thousand a week. And notice that the coefficients they've gone down by, the top has come down more than the bottom and the middle. So instead of fifty dollars a month down, they're down about thirty-two, thirty-three dollars. So, two emerging fields. If I was young and had my time over again, I would learn spatial temporal models, time series model, models that change over time and models that change over space. If HEB offers 10 cents off a gallon, it'll depend on where the gas station is and what time of the day whether people will take it up. And then text analytics, scraping web pages. And here's a, an interesting text analytics. I'm gonna let you read the, the nerdy story that was in Machine Learning Journal and I'm gonna show you the the article out of Wired. Basically, 
there are 51,000 manhole covers in New York City. And every year, a bunch of them explode, catch on fire, hurt people, in odd cases, even kill people. What they want to be able to do is order from most likely to blow up to least likely to blow up all of those manhole covers, right? Because they can't service 51,000 of them. So what they did was take all the engineering reports, scrape those, tidied up the data. There were 31 versions of some terms and text analyze. And they were able to identify three quarters of the, of the manholes that were going to blow up in the next year. So this is my MS Analytics class that's about to graduate. These are people who have at least three years of work experience who do a part-time program and a five-semester project using data from their own job. It's the best thing we do and the most difficult. I have supervised, I think I'm up to nearly 150 master's projects. I have seen every version of good and every version of dumb at least twice. So here are some of the real good ones. The, um, a woman is a senior manager with the Department of Social Security. She used decision trees to identify fraudulent patterns in Social Security applications. She can identify, these are ones that get flagged for special attention, more than 75% of them correctly. It's astonishing. I've signed a non-disclosure agreement. I can't tell you what the key factors are, but man, yeah. It's very interesting and it makes sense. The second one is a guy who works for a marketing company in Austin used a client he had, the Air Force. And so he analyzed every person who went to that site, which way they navigated through the site, on a phone, on a tablet, on a laptop, and found which were the ones, the paths that were most likely to get people to apply. And he identified death pages. You pay, get paid $18,000 a month, uh, a year, not a month, $18,000 a year when you join the Air Force. And the description of the basic training, those two, no one ever applied if they went there. And he doubled the application rate. Predicting bandwidth utilization on telecom cell towers. Have you ever been to a football game here? You can't get any coverage. There's 4,000 cell towers and you need time series models for them. So you need to cluster the towers and fit not 4,000 models. Some of the easier ones, women's apparel, which part of an online article drives its popularity? That was really interesting. If it's about Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, let's give me a long article. I want to know every mind-numbing detail of who did what to whom, how often, and who was involved and how much did it cost, and where did it happen. And if it's a business article, lots of technical terms and to the point. Really interesting again. Um, Predicting vehicle crashes on highways ahead of time. We have a student, I taught a time series class and I, this is a technical mumbo jumbo. I say, you never double difference. They say you can. In my 40 years of doing this, I've never had to. I put a question on the exam. This student double difference and he got a better solution to me than I did. Uh, modeling the relationship between earned media activity and city bike use, you know, city bike. You swipe your card, you get on the bicycle, you ride, you put it back in the rack. So the most important variables are time of the year, temperature, day of the week, and if there's been a positive or negative story about this. And the thing is, what's the gap? How many weeks ahead of time does it take for the media to have an effect? Predicting market share for drilling rigs, and then time series analysis of to pre predict weekly rig count. So if you're an oil service company, if you can find out ahead of time there's going to be demand for a lot of rigs, then you can get ready for that. And this guy, Niccolo, actually has a startup company called realrig.com, where you can go and buy his predictions. You can go and buy his predictions. And his secret formula, input, input, he doesn't tell you. Because if he told you, then he wouldn't be able to sell the thing. And he does better than... There's the actuals. His 12 weeks ahead yesterday was off by one in 900 and something. So he's going to do well. Let's talk about lessons in life. Is intelligence fixed or expandable? 
Well, a lot of these studies, psychologists worked on people who are unhappy for a long time. And recently they've started working on successful and happy people. Well, it turns out in this one study, one group of students says, I can't solve these problems, I'm not smart enough. This is all too hard. I te love to teach undergraduate service courses and about a quarter of the kids are just like that. Well, there are other people who say they can expand their abilities if they try. And that's my experience. I've hired a lot of people. I've gotten tenure and promotion for a lot of people. Um, I don't want to give away too many home truths. But I've seen people come in with the most credentialed from the best universities. The faculty just adored this person. They would have walked on broken glass. Make sure you promise everything. Don't lose this kid. And other people come in where they go, oh, yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. And the not sure person turns out to be a red hot star. Within five years has won all of these incredible awards. So being smart is important, but it's not the be-all or end-all. Intelligence is expandable. Find ways to negotiate ill-structured problems. That's what research is about. That's what if you're going to be useful to a company, can you solve an ill-structured problem? Why should they pay you a big pay packet if the answer's straightforward? And then this is Manny Parson, who was a distinguished professor who sadly passed away last year at age... Uh, he was born in 1929. And then his son is, a, is a, a lecturer, senior lecturer at Harvard Statistics. And so they have this thing that says, OK, you need high IQ, but you also need high CQ, character quotient. You need to be able to take a conversation with people, curiosity, commitment, and compassion. So when Parson would come around to your house for dinner, the first thing he would do is go over to your bookshelf and look at your books. And I asked him, why are you doing that, mate? Well, it means I can have a conversation. For me, they see books about wine. So there are what my mother used to say, social cripples. Have you ever heard the term social cripple? Someone who's real smart but doesn't get on well with people. That's not a, a great success factor. And then Davenport. Some say he termed the coin, coined the term data scientist competing on analytics, the need is for front room statisticians, people you can put in front of people who can actually explain stuff, versus back room statisticians, people who are not business oriented. Back room statisticians we call pizza scientists. You put pizza under the door in the morning, if you get any computer output out, you put pizza under the door and you rinse and repeat till you stop getting any output. Now, I have gone to company meetings with some of the smartest people in the world, both here in Asia and in Sydney and the faculty member who's a genius will argue with the company and tell them what they're doing is wrong. Not helpful. Not helpful. But we live in an incredible time. This is Tib Sharani who you met last time. Most of my life I went to parties and heard a little groan when people heard what I said, heard what I did. Now they're really excited to meet me. So in my lifetime I used to have to explain why statistics should be part of the business curriculum to now it's one of the most important subjects. So my views on a successful life and career, seek out role models and learn from their experiences. Especially people who have skills you don't have. So I talked to the woman who was the CEO of United Airlines in Australia and New Zealand. She was a high school English teacher. She didn't have much financial training. She had the best financial people you could get because that was her blind spot. Most people, though, won't do that because they're scared. Don't be afraid to ask challenging questions. If you want to, you can always make things easier. But don't start with the easiest questions. Have a real passion for whatever you decide to do. You can see I'm passionate about statistics. I love to teach undergraduates. I've got two sections of 97. I don't really need to do that. I don't need to supervise. 50 master's students a year, but that's what I love to do. Both at work and outside of work. Here's my experience, again, in three countries. If you focus just on your work, for a while you'll be incredibly successful. But then if things go badly, you will not handle it well because you have nothing else to fall upon. Nothing else. So it's all about having some passion outside of life. So when I first came here, the new student, graduate student conference, three slides from a faculty member, research interests, teaching interests, and what you do outside of work. That was really interesting. 
Um, in any team-based environment, care about the feelings of others, enjoy and celebrate others' success, help other people achieve untapped potential, demonstrate excellence. If you want to get a job in a company, the fact that you've worked in a team-based environment is one of the number one things they look at. One of the other things they look at is you haven't had too many jobs. <laughs> so when somebody applies who's had 18 jobs in 20 years to the Masters of Analytics program, I write, I don't write on the thing because there's open records, I put OMDB. You know what OMDB stands for? Over my dead body. <laughs> so if you want to go to the startup world, you can bounce around. But that's the only place where you can have a lot of jobs. Success brings many opportunities along with an obligation to give back. Again, I've gone and talked to business and the first question they asked me was not what I've achieved but what, what have I done to give back? Well, I have an award in honour of my mother that I endowed and I was on the executive of the Boys and Girls Club here locally for six years. Anyway, it's interesting. And then here's... Uh, uh, somebody looked at data science jobs in April 2017 and what they mentioned. SQL, structured query language. How many people know structured query language? Everybody else should. It's about how you join tables. You've got to know how to do this. The second one is Python. How many people know Python? Good. You should learn more. It's great for scraping and stuff. In Kaggle, last year Python overtook R as the most popular language. Then you have Java, Hadoop. What's Hadoop? It's this way to analyze in real time mountains of data. Anyway, you can read down. Tableau, SAS is there. Notice that this is an R website, R for stats. So I'm not sure about the bias between. So here's the deal for me. If you want a job with the big end of town, SAS will be much more important than R. If you want a job with a startup, R will be much more important than SAS but make sure you know how to do Python, SQL, and a bunch of the others. I'm done. Happy to answer any questions. So you have my contact details on the front. I'm happy to get people internships or help, but I have to vouch for you, right? So you have to, I have to be convinced that you will do well. You understand? So if you have a strong grade point average, and that fella over there will vouch for you, right? And you know how to do SAS and SQL, for instance, and you give me plenty of warning, I can help you get an internship, all right? I'm happy to talk to everybody. So uh, for SAS, by the way, uh, and I love that you have not seen it, you know, you've seen some R. Uh, there are online training uh, courses and tutorials and stuff. Right. Stat 404 is half R and half SAS. So there's a good place to start once you get through that class and you, you have a good background. Yeah, so one of the questions I ask people who are a bit of bolder than you, tell us about the most interesting bottle of wine you've ever had and why. It's often not the most expensive. It's usually about some special occasion. My favorite is from the BBC comedy called IT Crowd, that's based upon you know, the uh, uh, goofy IT guys who work in the basement of a huge company and they get invited to a, a party with the CEO. And one of them brings a bottle of wine and on the label it just says white wine. <laughs> so one of these professors left the University of New South Wales as a real wine man. We went to this restaurant, was bring your own wine, and I was in charge of delegating. So this fellow called Mark Hurst is now the dean of a business school in Queensland. I put him in charge of getting the bottle of champagne. I said, get uh, Paul Roger or Tattinger. So he goes, we're sitting up and sitting at the end of the table. He comes out with Sir Winston Churchill, Paul Roger, Chat. 
I have never seen this in real life. You can, there's nowhere. And so I go thumbs up to Hursty, and he's going thumbs up to me because he thinks that I didn't trust him and I bought the champagne. We drank this, and it was another table on the other side of the restaurant for their 25th wedding anniversary. Yeah. Um, I watched a brief interview you did a while back, and you were talking about how to select uh, your professors. And you um, stated you wanted, for a master's program, select quality professors. Yeah. So how that's... do you define, as a, or, and how was I as a student when I quantify a quality professor, though? That's a great question. So let's, let's divide the world into an oversimplification of two things. Imagine you want to get a job and you're doing a professional master's degree. What's a great professor there? Or you're going to do a PhD or even an undergraduate major and what's a great professor there? So a great professor for a PhD is somebody with a track record of research themselves and a long track record of students. Some of the most famous people tend to be idiosyncratic and don't like to work with a lot of students. And there are others who have this great list, maybe 50 people they've worked with. Now, if you're going to get a professional master's degree, I'd say, of the professors, do they have real world experience? Do they have street credibility? I mean, that they really know their stuff, and have they applied it? Because if I'm going to talk about oil and gas, I've got three guys in the audience who are going to argue with me about how this works in oil and gas. So I need to have some experience, right? Does that answer? Definitely. Yeah. Congratulations, that's a wonderful achievement. Great school. Um, I was wondering, what is your opinion on the academic world, like working in the United States versus working in somewhere overseas? And hmm. which do you think is really more, what were the pro and cons? Um, it's always great to work somewhere else. You learn another system. You kind of also sort of check out of your life. You know, you don't. You, you don't have to go to Auntie Mary's party or whatever it is. You know, you can, as a young person, kind of disappear for six months and do your own thing and learn a different culture. That's great. Um, it's pretty naive to move. I didn't really, I had been here twice. The health system, the tax system, all of that, I had no clue how it works. So moving temporarily is, is I think, an incredible thing to do. It's, it's a great resume thing. Whether you're an academic or whether you want to work in business, international experience is extraordinary. The thing to do is to pick uh, the right place. And the right place is a combination of w what it is, what your duties are, and who you can work with. If you can go and work with Mary Marvelous, a well-known person in your field that enjoys mentoring new postdocs, that would be incredible. The big thing about grad school is I still have all the papers I ever read in a file. I bought them from Australia. Because that's really the, what I know right well. Because you have more time as a graduate student than you'll ever have in your whole life. So the thing to do is to be broad. Is to be broad. The great thing about the US system is you get to take classes. And you get to find out what people are like. And you should talk to their students, not just one of them to find out what the styles are like. Because someone can be the right area, and if they're a micromanager and you don't like that, or they're a loosey-goosey, come and see me once a semester and you don't like that, it's about fit. <laughs>